thank you for being here. It's so great to be with everyone. As Alan said, yeah, I heard, yes, I would have said, oh, we're at 75, not 72 million, like the slide says. So thank you, Alan. And at Jackie and Alan, um, can we first just give them a round of applause for all the work they've been doing? Um, so uh, it's funny. My team and I sat down about a m month ago knowing that I was going to have this conversation with Reed, which I'm very much looking forward to, turning the tables. Um, but those of you who know Reed know that four weeks in Reed world is like four years. So I think he's written two more books, he's launched a podcast. He, so I wanted to keep this fresh. And so I, I decided to frame our conversation around your most recent endeavor, Masters of Scale. It's a podcast uh, that we announced, launched yesterday, hashtag Masters of Scale. It's fantastic. But Reed, could you tell us a little bit about this and how it came about? So uh, about, let's see. So it starts with um, the fact that, this, that what Silicon Valley tells itself in the world about what its secrets are is now no longer correct. So it used to be we have entrepreneurs, we have venture capital, we have tech universities, we have tech, we have tech companies. We mixed them all in a pot early and it created a, you know, kind of a soup and a network and that created stuff. And so all, it's all the startup story. It's the lack of fear of failure, it's the multiple shots on goal. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, it's still true, but it's insufficient because as many of us here know, or all of us perhaps, that that uh, entrepreneurial energy, uh, that uh, culture that doesn't necessarily uh, penalize failure, et cetera, is shifting everywhere in the world. And it's, in, in, and it's grow well, in many places of the world, not everywhere, but in, uh, broadly uh, in many places of the world. And, uh, and yet Silicon Valley continues to persist in creating uh, super interesting companies. And a huge percentage of the NASDAQ is within 50 miles of where we're sitting right now. And, uh, and so why is that? And that's because actually, in fact, Silicon Valley is not just startup, but it's scale up. And in how it does scale in particular ways. And so I started that by kind of writing um, some essays, which then we decided to turn into a book. I taught a class on this about 18 months ago on Stanford. Blitz scaling. Blitz scaling. Because it's, it's uh, spending capital aggressively in order to uh, expand to broadly a global market. Um, obviously, you know, the probably poster child for blitz scaling is Uber, but it's also Airbnb and back in PayPal when I was an executive there, are all instances of it. And it's the, uh, it's the set of the knowledge about how to do that and how to like, for example, double and quadruple an organization in size, uh, deal with customer uh, acquisition issues at, at, at super linear rates, deal with customer support issues at super linear rates, like there's a PayPal story where we were growing at two to five percent uh, trans, uh, transaction volume per day. Um, we had so many angry customers because we had three customer service reps that uh, essentially uh, customers were figuring out what our corporate line was, even though basically it wasn't listed, and dialing extensions at random. So 24 by seven, you could pick up any desk phone and you could talk to an angry customer. So, you know, like, like, what do you do in those kinds of things? And that was all kind of blitzscaling. And then June Cohen, who's a former executive producer of TED and a good friend of both Linda's and mine, yeah. said, hey, I would love to do, I have this new concept for a podcast series. And, uh, and I actually think that, that this, the, this material that you're, uh, is like, what is scale? Because scale is what creates a lot of these valuable opportunities. And you guys all know this from Endeavor Time, which is, High impact entrepreneurship is the kind of the, this is the thing we focus on, this is the thing we build, it creates prosperity, it creates jobs, you know, et cetera. She's like, I'd like to do this with you. And this, of course, was last June, <laughs> right? And so I was like, yeah, sure, we'll be able to do that, which is launching in May. And then, of course, the election intervenes, <laughs> a bunch of other things. And so, of course, we scrambled to do this in March to get this all launched. But that's, that's, the, that's how it came out. And it's, it's 10 episodes, right? Well, so it's actually, it's, 10 um, highly edited episodes, which includes like original music and sound effects and a bunch of other stuff, which you know is all Junes and Teams wizardry. I, I was like, oh, that's what you had in mind. That's kind of cool. Um, and then we will also um, uh, uh, parse in lightly edited versions of the of the full um, the full interview. So, like for example, in the edited interview that Linda's part of. 
you'll probably be three quotes or four quotes from that in that 30 minute, you know, three kind of statements, four statements, but there will also be the full interview that Linda and I did, um, you know, kind of also released as a second standalone piece. Well, it, it's, first of all, it's amazing, but also I have two things to thank you for. First of all, Endeavor has been saying, um, not only high impact entrepreneurship, but we started talking about scale up, not startup, because when we would go into new places and they say, but we have incubators, we have accelerators. And we're like, no, we're about the scale up. And they'd look at us and go, what? So first of all, thank you, because I think what you've been doing is really popularizing it at a new level. And we know that that's where a lot of the wealth creation comes in. But on a personal note, so there, there are 10 episodes. The first is Brian Chesky's we're going to get to in a minute. You, it was Bill Gates. Zuckerberg. Linda. Cheryl. Yeah, well, Cheryl. <laughs> Sanford. So the, that's the point. It's yeah. Endeavor's 20th anniversary. Yeah. The hardest thing about being an entrepreneur is your parents don't know what the hell you do. So still, after 20 years, my parents are like, how do I explain this to my friends? So now they've been sending this PR Newswire thing saying, here's Reed's, Reed Hoffman's podcast with Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Cheryl Zandberg, and Linda. It's validating. We still don't know what she does, but somehow <laughs> it seems valid to somebody. So thank you. She's on the right list. Yes. Reed Hastings is a whole set of people. Reed Hastings. Yeah. Of no yeah, exactly. All right. So speaking of Brian Chesky, um, well, I want to play a clip and then we can react because what I loved about what the clip we're going to show here is it gets into your investing philosophy, okay? So let's take a listen. I want to share what happens after an entrepreneur leaves the room and investors left them all over. A crazy idea. It begins with a debrief of the investor's partners. If I'm presenting an idea to my partners at Greylock and they all go, that's great, we should do that, I'm like, Sh Here's a bunch of hyper smart people and no one saying, oh, watch out for this or watch out for that. It's too easy. The idea is so obviously good. I can already hear the stampede of competitors trampling over our hopeful little startup. On the other hand, you don't want every person in the room to say, Reed, you're out of your mind. <laughs> because then you're wondering, hmm, am I drinking the Kool-Aid in a very bad way? What you want is some people going, you guys are out of your minds. And some people going, I see it. You want a polarized reaction. So first of all, I love this because, as yeah. you know, we have the ISPs. Every Endeavor entrepreneur here was selected through the yeah. ISPs. You have to get to unanimity, unanimity with six people. And I always say, when it's 6-0 on the first vote, I'm like, oh, that <laughs> entrepreneur is not going to go very far. But if there's this huge fight, you're like, we are on to something. But let's get into the Airbnb mm. story. But to walk us through that investor committee meeting. Ah, uh, so, um, well, so what... Uh, Another, uh, so we, uh, I met Airbnb, I met Brian, Joe, and uh, Nate. Uh, they were actually probably the quickest I've gotten to. A couple minutes in, I said, look, I'm gonna offer you a term sheet. Let's just shift this from a pitch meeting to a working meet. Tell me what your problems, your risk, other kinds of things are. Um, because I had already reference checked them, and once I understood it was eBay for space, not couch surfing, which is how some, who I won't name, some doofus, basic. I, I met Airbnb months later than I than I than I should have, because someone framed it for me as, oh, it's couch surfing, and I was like, couch surfing, terrible idea. <laughs> like it doesn't work. You know, low price economics. Everyone who does it does it because it's their only choice because it's low price. You can't build a really interesting business out of this. But then it was like, no, no, we're doing everything. We're doing everything from couches, yes, rooms, apartments, houses, castles. You know, it's the whole thing. It's like, oh, this is eBay for space. Yes, this totally is a good idea. Then we get to the partner discussion, and part of the partner discussion is this: when we uh, invest in Airbnb, there might have been a hundred stays a week. I mean, it was wow. like a tiny thing, and a bunch of issues. Like uh, partners were like, "Oh my God, it's unsafe. The liabilities will be huge. Uh, cities will hate this. The hotel industry will crush it." Like all of these things come up in a partner meeting. And eventually, David Z, who is a, uh, a basically a world record VC, he invested in uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Pandora, turned to me and said, look, every VC has to have a deal they fail on. This can be yours. <laughs> right? So you got, you, got, you, you got permission to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> How many times have you brought that up with him since? Well, so, uh, no, look, I, I chose David for my board at LinkedIn. I think David, I think He's the world awesome. of David. He's awesome. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, basically never, but David brings it up because David, like all great entrepreneurs, is a learning machine. And David came back to me about 
nine months later and said, what did you see that I didn't see? <laughs> like, like, okay, clearly you were right, I was wrong, <laughs> right? What, what was the thing you saw? And I said, look, it was really, it was risk, but part of how I look at these kinds of Series A and occasionally Series B discussion is, decisions is, is there a credible shot at something huge? Mm -hmm. Do I think these people could pull it off? One of the, the pieces of advice that I give to investors is, the way I look at an investment, sure, I hope to add a lot of value, but the question I ask myself is, would I give these people the money and say, call me in five years? Right, literally like, okay, how'd it go? Because if they're not capable enough of running the race themselves, yeah. you're not gonna add that much in. So sometimes it could be a specific thing. I need to help them find an engineering partner or something. Like you say, okay, right. I'll take that as an additional risk, but it's one thing, but they have, they have what it takes. And I said, look, Brian, Nate, and Joe, they have the grit and the hustle that's essential for marketplaces, yeah. and this category should exist. Now, there's a ton of things that could blow it up. So it happens to have now been a storied success. We always tend to think it's manifest destiny. It would nat naturally get there. You know, most of these things. Uh, PayPal is probably the worst in terms of number of near-death experiences. <laughs> but Airbnb has had a few, too. Now, you were brought into Greylock for a specific area. I don't remember if it was consumer payments. There, were some, no, there was some space, and then managed to do no deals in that space. Well, it's not right. bad, actually. We don't bring in partners uh, for specific areas, although we loosely divide up mm -hmm. just so we kind of have, like, oh, so-and-so's current and so forth. Um, but actually, what you're referring to is actually a funny thing, which is part of what happens is when, a, when a, an investor is deeply familiar with all the landmines, they tend to not make any of those investments. And so I am clearly the payments expert at Greylock, and we have made zero payments <laughs> investments. I've looked at Square, I've looked at Stripe, I've looked at, and you know, like I was actually, last time I was at the Ritz Carlton, I was actually in this ballroom talking to Patrick Collison on stage yeah, because yeah. he came by for a, for a LinkedIn event. And, um, and you know, love Patrick and John and so forth. And I just was like, oh God, how does, like, how, <laughs> you know, like I'm aware of all of the landmines here. And so I actually brought it up with my partnership because I said, look, I'm, I'm fearful that I'm too knowledgeable about this space and that someone else should go approach payments with a new mind and have me be helpful because I just kind of look at this and I, you know, maybe it's PayPal PTSD, but it's, <laughs> it's like I look at this and I go, oh yeah, there's so many ways you can die there. Because at PayPal, the way that I described what we did is when we, um, I was on the founding board, we didn't even know what chargebacks were. And we ran out into a minefield, not knowing it was a minefield. And once you're halfway through a minefield, you go, well, well, back is dead, forward probably is dead too, but you might as well go forward and you just keep running. And we like ran over so many mines, it was unbelievable. Well, I have to admit, I had somewhat of an ulterior motive in mm -hmm. that, that uh, follow-up because Oftentimes, an MD uh, will call me prior to a selection panel and say, I need a panelist that's a specialist in SaaS on this panel for my company. I'm like, no, you really don't want that <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if you want your company to pass. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, all these problems. Yes. Um, okay. Well, I think it was Mar Mark Andreessen said something that I know a lot of people said, which is that if you, if, when you are a VC, I know you're an entrepreneur too, and it's mm. found, but even, and in your hat as a VC, you always worry about the one that got away. Yes. So what... What was the one that got away? <clears throat> Actually, um, David Cowan at Bessemer popularized a concept that I like that I haven't really gone done yet, but it's the anti-portfolio. It's <laughs> like the portfolio that you made mistake, like you made the mistake of not doing. And so we all have a deep anti-portfolio. I think I would say two companies for two different reasons. So one is Twitter, and the reason Twitter was because I hadn't really tracked the change to Twitter. So it started as odd blog, which is audio blogging. And at Odd Blog, they were doing everything to try to get on my calendar. And I was like, audio blogging. <laughs> no, <laughs> terrible idea. Not, no, no, I, I, Eb's great, et cetera. No, I'm not interested. Um, and, so, and so therefore, when, when, when Twitter got birthed out of Odd Blog, the, uh, like I just wasn't anywhere close to it, even though it's the kind of thing that's you know, a public network, a bunch of things that are interesting to me. And by the time it, it kind of took off, it was, it was beyond the early stage of investing I do. The other one was Pinterest. Oh, interesting. And uh, I actually met them pretty early. I met them before, uh, just before their venture round. Uh, and um, this was a mistake where I just didn't understand their users. 
because I looked at it and I went, okay, this pinning metaphor, et cetera, I don't really get how this turns into a platform. I get how you might, it looked to me more like a Facebook game with kind of a shelf life mm -hmm. as opposed to like a enduring network or platform. And I think what it, I think the real diagnosis came down to is, you know, uh, 85% of their initial users were mid Midwestern women. And I just didn't grok that case. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's part of the reason why actually, in fact, the, the venture firm that ended up doing it was Bessemer. And part of the reason why Bessemer did it is because Sarah Tavel, who's now a partner at Greylock, had sourced it and brought it into Bessemer because she understood that, <laughs> right? And then she went and joined Pinterest and then uh, came and joined us afterwards. I love that. Yeah. And, and you, you're, uh, I was reminded when you said Pinterest, you thought it was a Facebook game. My 12-year-old daughters were asked by their six-year-old cousin. Um, he asked, what is Facebook? And one of my 12-year-olds replied, Instagram for old people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, obviously. Yeah. Did you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to go to a new clip because... Oh. Reed, one of the things I love about, about you is that you're constantly learning and you're, you're constantly willing to, in the face of new information or in the face of, uh, of someone you respect, like have your mind changed, which is not a common quality in an entrepreneur. I want to get back to that. But when I asked June Cohen, speaking of uh, your, your producer, what was one of her favorite moments in this, where did Reed kind of change his mind? She um, mentioned this clip with Sheryl Sandberg. You have to repeat your mission and your purpose and the values you care about over and over and over. And sometimes you're like, doesn't everyone know this? It doesn't matter. Starting out your meetings with this is the Facebook mission, this is the Instagram mission, this is why WhatsApp exists is so powerful, even if everyone knows it by heart because it reminds you where you're headed and why you're going there. The repetition of mission is extremely important, and I've seen it in all good scale leaders. It's actually one of the things that I've had to learn myself, because I had a tendency to think, hey, everyone knows our mission, we're all smart, let's move on. And I used to be somewhat skeptical of putting your mission statement or values on posters on the wall. It seemed controlling and vaguely Orwellian, like fascist marketing. I love that, the fascist marketing, <laughs> you had me there, that was awesome. But, uh, tell us a little more about that. Well, so, uh, um, one of the things that the truly great uh, scale leaders understand is that they're trying to be the heartbeat for the whole organization. And it isn't about them going off and solving new intellectual problems themselves. They can do that too. But that's not actually what leadership looks like. You know, Cheryl's that way. Jeff Weiner's that way. Uh, Reed Hastings is that way. And what you, what you see with them is what they do is they put a ton of effort into distilling what that heartbeat should be, which is a, like a genuine mission statement. Like yes. mission statements are idiotic when they're like, you know, be excellent. We value excellence. <laughs> oh yeah, the counterparty of that. Oh, we value shoddiness and shittiness. Like, like oh, please. And then it sounds basically like you're in an Orwellian state. It's like, it's just like, okay. Um, and so, and so what you do is you try to do it to things that actually have an edge, have a cost, make strategic impact, cause you to invest differently, cause you to interact differently, and, and then um, enable that. So for example, you know, the first one, the first mission statement at LinkedIn, which I had actually created before, but hadn't repeated as much, was members first. And you think, oh, that's obvious, but actually here's why it's super important in a company like LinkedIn. Companies pay us 70% of our revenue. Organizations naturally orient to who pays them, right? So if you allowed LinkedIn right. to go where it would normally go, it would be companies first, members second, right? Because they would go, you guys are paying us all our money. What can we do better for you? And a company would say something like, well, we'd love to know when any of our employees are looking for a job, <laughs> right? And they'd be like, oh, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> right? And so part of what we codified is the individual members who do not pay us a dime, they are all our first customer. They are all the people that, is it good for them, is the very first question right. on any decision in the organization anywhere. Right? 
Because it's members and customers are not Absolutely. exactly the same thing, right? Yes. And so that yes. was the kind of thing that in order to do. Now, my mistake, and this is what I was referring to in learning, was I thought it through. I had a team meeting where I said, here's how we're thinking about it. Great, you all understand now. And then went back to working on other problems. <laughs> Jeff, more or less, finds a way to bring back an integration into the mission statement into kind of public comms at least every two weeks. Like there's, and it, it, um, public, internal. I mean, it could be public, but something that the company sees right. where it's still touching it. And he knows, like, you've, yes, you've heard it before. And yes, you might say, okay, I've heard this for the 15th time, but this is super important. And it isn't that he continues to do other things. And I went, oh, actually, in fact, if you think of what the scale leadership is, like LinkedIn like grew from 400 people to 10,000 you know, under uh, Jeff's CEO ship. And, um, and he's like, look, this is the blood of the organization, and we need to make sure that we're horizontally locked in and accountable. And, and by the way, you have to walk the walk, not just talk, clearly. Um, but then you, um, and then that's the way you make it happen. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, another great scale leader like Cheryl, when she said this, it was like, yes, this is exactly the kind of thing. Well, that, two, two things. First of all, the members first. I mean, I, I couldn't relate to that more because we have so many stakeholders, and yet I always say, and the team always knows, it's of, by, and for entrepreneurs. Yes. If every decision we make is of, by, and for entrepreneurs, that's how Catalyst, which we'll get to yes. later, came about, yes. then we're on the right track. Yes. But it's super interesting that now Google, don't be evil, they get into trouble for that. Uber, with its aggressive you know, market, these things can backfire if not done yes. right. I find that entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship is a, is a wartime game. Uh, there's actually, entrepreneurs tend to discount peacetime games. There's actually, there's, there's times to play wartime games, there's time to play peacetime games. All entrepreneurship is wartime games, right? So, so for me, because that's what I'm most focused on, I'm a wartime person, because this is part of the whole metaphor of you know, uh, doing a company is as as jumping off a cliff and assembling an airplane on the way down. That's a wartime game. Yes. And, uh, and so uh, I think about, do I want to go to war with these people? Like, would I want to be in the foxhole with these people? Right? That, that's actually one of the central things yes. that is a decision. And so, for example, like when I get approached a lot by people asking me, well, do you think I should join board X or board Y? And I say, well, you know, part of the thing to think about is, think if the chips are down, would you want to be in the foxhole with the CEO? And if the answer is, sure, maybe, you know, you'd prefer the chips weren't down, but you go, yeah, I'd like to be in that, I'd still want to be in the foxhole with the person. Mm -hmm. Then that's at least one of the checks on these things. And so, um, so no, Twitter I regret, uh, Pinterest I regret. You know, um, I just want to make one point here, two points here. First mm -hmm. of all, um, this is the, this week is the second anniversary of, of Dave Goldberg's passing. Um, Dave spoke at this event with, with Wences in a fireside chat three years ago. He's friends of all of us. He's actually an investor in Catalyst LP, so I wanted to um, just acknowledge that. But also, it, as important as the work Cheryl's doing with Option B and Lean In, I, I just want to say, I thought it was awesome that you've got her talking about Facebook. Yes. Because she is a scale leader. Yes. And every interview she has only yes. talks about Lean In and Option B. Those are super important, but I just wanted to thank you for getting her talking about what she actually does day to day. Yes, yes. No, and that was super important because people, like, people appreciate her for the lean in stuff. People appre or will appreciate her. Option B is obviously Absolutely. just launching. Yes. Um, but what they don't really realize is if you were to line up the, you know, three, ha like the three people that I would say are the best people to talk about scale with, Cheryl might be the first of those three and there's no question in the three. So that was the reason I was like, no, let's talk about this. Awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna start another clip and we, we will have a lot to talk about here. Uh -huh. Mafia has this kind of sordid undertone, you know, the, the bodies are buried in the backyard, you know, we have a merita, we don't talk about it, <laughs> you know, et cetera. And, you know, it makes it for a sexier magazine cover, it kind of gives you that little bit of sizzle for what the thing is. So I understand and appreciate why people use the term. But there really isn't a, speak about this and we kill you. If you have four or five people who are really dedicated, who trust each other, who are working together, they can be the core of a much wider network. 
Okay, so there's a lot to talk about here. And you know, for years I think, no, Reed, you have to own this. Endeavor's all about creating PayPal mafias. Come on, this is great. Um, but I, I do have to admit, Alan and Raffaele are um, uh, MD in Italy. We're mentioning that when we were doing the public launch in Italy, Raffaele had as the opening, creating Endeavor mafias. And Alan went and goes, I'm not sure this is such a good idea here, so. <laughs> Maybe you might have some people showing up. <laughs> like, where's my cut? <laughs> but all right, I want to talk on the micro side and then on the macro side. But on the micro side, you know, part of what Endeavor's about is this peer network and the founder to founder advice, which is just so unique and special. So can you talk about that in your in your own case? So um Life and work is a team sport, not an individual sport. We as human beings tend a lot more to always glorify the heroic individuals, founders, entrepreneurs, super important, as critical for making progress. But actually, in fact, uh, these things happen through teams, uh, organizations, companies. You know, you say, well, who is a great executive? Well, a great executive is somebody who forms an awesome team. That's actually the, the very first attribute that actually, in fact, really matters. And so, um, uh, you know, so part of this, when you begin to think about networks, is networks um, are a different form of team that are super important. And part of that is because uh, frequently the knowledge of a landmine, the knowledge of a risk, the knowledge of an opportunity, the knowledge of a key asset person or resource to give advice or to help is the thing that can make a difference between you know, dying and succeeding, between an inflection point and growth, between solving a problem in two weeks versus three months through a massive missed opportunity cost, which may be a fatal thing in the business. And so, you know, part of what, um, the way that I conceptualize projects, and this is one of the things I learned from Silicon Valley, that I, I basically just, this is, a, this is one of the few times where I, it's a hammer I use for everything. Like, it's like, there's nothing that I don't know of in the world where this hammer doesn't apply, which is, say, you have one to three principles, you assemble a board around them, and then you assemble a network through the board and through the principles to the project, whether it's a company or anything else. And that network assembly, which, of course, comes through the principles and through the board, is critical for what is the success percentage and the success amount of that project. And... And you think about that in investment, too. So for example, people frequently think about it, the, the, the metaphor they frequently think about investing is this kind of hunting, like I'm out there looking for the entrepreneur in the wild. And actually, in fact, that's, a, mm, I mean, if you can't do anything else, okay. <laughs> you know, it's better than sitting around. But actually, in fact, what I tend to do is I build networks and then I basically uh, live in the network mm -hmm. as a way of sourcing it. So, like, I, I don't think, including Airbnb, I don't think I've invested in a deal that I went out and found in, like, 10 years, right? Like, it all comes from, like, my last, I made a couple of stealth investments since this one, but my last public investment is this company called Convoy, which is Uber for regional trucking. And, you know, Dan Lewis is awesome. He's exactly that kind of learning entrepreneur that you want and kind of had this kind of infinite learning curve. But the way I found it, was a friend of mine, Hadi Partobi, called me and said, this is the real thing, right? And I was like, great, I'll take a meeting. And it was like, literally, it was like, da -da. I was like, great. It went from, whereas normally, like I probably get 20 to 50 emails a day asking for meetings. I get people walking up to me in yeah. restaurants asking for meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Like, all of those is no. This was yes in three seconds. Interesting. <laughs> right, so, and then we did the investment. And one of the things, so one of the, people uh, uh -huh. in the payment is, is Peter Teal. Yes. And, and you two are, are so different in so many ways, philosophically, politically, <laughs> uh, temperamentally. And so how, that's so interesting. So how, how does that relationship work? So Peter and I met at Stanford when he had been hearing from his friends that there was this pinko Kami, that's me, <laughs> um, and I had been hearing from my friends that there was this guy who was right wing of Attila the Hun. <laughs> and so we both were in this philosophy class together, and we literally went, wait, I've heard, it. I've heard about you, <laughs> right? I think I want to talk to you. And we both, it was kind of like, oh, well, I guess we both. And so we then uh, met for, uh, on a Sunday, like a couple days later, and we argued for eight hours. 
And I mean, literally, and we were doing, there's this form of argument called reductio ad absurdum, which is, <laughs> what you try to do is take their principles and derive an absurd conclusion, so therefore they need to reject their principles. And so both of us were doing this, aha, I got you now because that's absurd. And then the other person would say, yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> you like, wait, you can't think that. So we had eight hours of that. Um, <laughs> and I think the thing that uh, Peter and I really appreciate about each other, um, you know, taking a little bit of thing of, of speaking for him, but we find that because one of the things we both deeply value is the nature of truth-seeking intellectual discussion, uh, intellect, intellectual openness in order to uh, you know, kind of really listen to interesting counterpositions, like to be contrarian and right, you have to be listen, listening to counterpositions. And so uh, we've actually grown to really appreciate the... Um, uh, the kind of the intellectual points on a wide variety of things, philosophy, et cetera. Now, politics is a little bit more challenging. Um, I was hoping recently. to save us. None of us can go to <laughs> meals with people who voted differently in the last election. I was hoping we can all get along and you could tell us how. Um, well, uh, you know, I think um, I'm still working on it. Um, Peter and I have had dinner uh, since uh, Trump's election. I still don't understand it. Um, like, you know, Peter made an impassioned defense of mercantile capitalism and tariffs, and I was like, huh? <laughs> like, you're really smart, <laughs> right? So there's got to be something in what you're saying, so I need to think about it, <laughs> right? Um, and, like, uh, I haven't yet gone and talked to him about his comments about Trump, about, you know, take him substantively, not literally. And I'm like, Peter, intellectuals, language matters, word matters. Like, I take everybody literally, right? Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, I, I don't think that's an acceptable defense of a person. You may say, look, you've got to listen to the substance. You know, bang, you know, like, criticize them for the, for, for the language, but listen to the substance. And look, there's, I'm sympathetic to the, the impulses that, an, that some Trump voters have had of saying, we feel that the last few decades of the U.S. is leaving us behind. Uh, if you go to a bunch of rural uh, counties in the U.S., and uh, rural-ish, they have heroin problems. Uh, everyone is like two or three degrees away from someone who has a serious heroin problem. Yeah. Uh, they worry about their economic futures for their children. Uh, you know, the children say, well, we either you have to move to a place, but move away from the family, so it's breaking up the family. You get the, I have pain, right? Do something about my pain, and saying I'm status quo so, well, but this is what has been happening for the last 10 to 30 years. So, like, I'm just going to be more of the status quo. You're not doing anything. So, for them, to some degree, Trump's saying, at least not, he's claiming he's going to do something, which I obviously think is, you know, like, I think I can now state this confidently. One of the things I said in a, an argument with Peter in 2016 was I said, he has no plans, right? He claims he has plans. He has no plans. He just has reality TV mission statements of, I have a tremendous plan for healthcare. My plan for healthcare will include everybody and be much cheaper. And you're like, what fantasy land is that? <laughs> right? Like, you have to do math to make these things work. And so, uh, and I think that's played out <laughs> more or less the way that I predicted to Peter in 2016. And so I, um, so Peter and I haven't yet gotten into a full-blooded argument since the inauguration, but I suspect that we're going to have to reserve another Sunday uh, some no time in the not-too-distant future and really go through it. At least eight hours. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so one of the, I was on uh, moderating a, f a founders, a successful founders panel yesterday with Gebert and Glibiana from uh, Globin, Nick Nolito of Zerpas, and Romero Rodriguez of Buscape. And I said, you know, there's something about the founder to founder adv mentor advice that is different than anyone else. Even if it's tough love, one of the examples mm -hmm. I gave, and then I, I want, as you're thinking of yours, was mm -hmm. one of our catalyst investees and Endeavor entrepreneurs, I told this yesterday, but for those who weren't there, is Nevzad Dean of Yem Acceptus. So he builds this online food delivery company, massively successful, sells it for $589 million, the largest internet exit in Turkey's history. Um, he and his uh, co-founder, Melly, donate shares uh, as if there were stock options where there hadn't been to, to all the employees. He's like this huge role model calls up another Endeavor entrepreneur, Hakan Bas, and says, uh, Hakan, 
been seeing a lot of headlines about you recently. And I was like, wow, coming from you, Navzad, that means a lot. She said, no, no, no. I've been seeing headlines about you dating supermodels and going to conferences, nothing about building your fucking company. I, sorry. <laughs> He's, and he says, I don't want to read another newspaper article about you that's not about your company. And hangs up the phone. It's yes. like, wow, that's only a fellow founder yes. would give you that advice. Yes. So in that spirit, what's the toughest piece of advice you've ever received and ever given from another founder? Um, so received... Uh, you know, obviously, there's a wide variety of things to pick from in both questions. <laughs> um, I'd say on the receive side, it was probably from John Lilly, who is now partner at Greylock, uh, was the CEO of Mozilla, was the C CEO uh, and co-founder of Reactivity um, mm -hmm. before then, uh, which is kind of an enterprise incubator of sorts, and, um, or Spawner or something. The, um, and uh, we were talking about diversity in Silicon Valley companies. And I said, look, I, I make an effort to, to try to uh, interview um, you know, minorities, women, uh, Hispanics, blacks, and so forth, and so forth. And you know, I try to make sure that we have hidden bias training in the organization and so forth. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. I'm like, I'm ahead of everyone else. He's like, that's not good enough. And I was like, what? <laughs> right? I mean, I'm a sensitive, <laughs> progressive, thoughtful person. <laughs> right? You know, he's like, look, we clearly have a serious fucking problem here. And I guess you're going to have a lot of bleeps in your video. <laughs> and uh, It's okay. It's Endeavor. We're <laughs> yeah, fine. Yeah. And uh, across the whole valley in this, I mean, as bad as the gender issue is, when you get to black and Hispanic, I mean, we're California. And literally, I can list the Hispanic entrepreneurs and the Hispanic VCs. It's not a long list, right? And so, and this is California, when you think about population and density and so forth. Right. And so um, he says, look, you know, you sit there saying, I'm doing my part because I'm, I'm doing my little different pieces within my own organization, and with power comes responsibility, and you're a powerful leader here. Get off your fucking ass and do something. And I was like, you're right. <laughs> right, I will start. Yeah. I will start going work on this, right? Because it was like, yeah, yeah well, I was sitting there thinking I was all proud of myself, and actually, in fact, I I'm under delivering my responsibilities. I love that. Yeah. Okay, and now on the other yeah. side, that was awesome. I love that. <laughs> and then I've not heard that before either. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I uh, well, no one's ever asked me that question before. But that was that was a that was a John Lilly. John and I do that to each other. <laughs> that was a John Lilly uh, special. Uh, John, John is my, normally my poster child. The way I usually uh, razz him back is he was the person who told me that categorically LinkedIn would fail when I uh, told him I was thinking about launching it. it fun. <laughs> um, and so, um, and obviously I love John because I hired him in the Greylock. The, I'd say the, probably the toughest piece of advice... You know, I probably can't name the person because it's probably not my place to do. But roughly speaking, and I've done this a couple of times, so at least gives a little anonymity. Frequently, what will happen is someone will say, um, "I should be CEO forever," when they shouldn't be. They're actually not scaling with it. And so, what you have to do is you have to confront them with the choice of: Is it more about you, or is it more about the company? And mm -hmm. usually to get them to see that is an hour lead up conversation. Because you have to talk about all kinds of different things, the right. nature of the problem, what the company needs, how it's playing, and all the rest. And what has been usually a year plus of systemic repetitive failures that, okay. that play to a certain set of weaknesses that are within the, you know, the kind of the, the, the CEO and usually co-founder position. And, you, and then you say, look, at the end of the day, I'm back, I back entrepreneurs. So if you say it's more about me than the company, right, and, and, and that's how I actually really look at it, fine. But if you're trying to persuade me that me is good for the company, I've just spent an hour wow. building the case about why that is actually, in fact, not the case, right? And that what you should really look for, and this is one of the, like Jeff Weiner, uh, is you should look for a yeah. co-founder, because the mistake that Silicon Valley and a lot of people make in hiring CEOs, they say, well, you hire an experienced executive. 
Who cares in an entrepreneurial company about the experience? You want these tools, you want the skill set. You're really hiring a late stage co-founder who has some of those critical tools that you don't have. Mm -hmm. Let's go find that person. It may take a year. It may take 18 months. And by the way, if after this tough love conversation, all of a sudden it suddenly starts working, great, no problem. I prefer that universe. But face reality, and people will always tell themselves it's about the company. But then you have to think, look, are you making the choices on the part of the company? So literally every single organization that I'm part of, boards and everything else, if I can think of better people than me who should be in my role yes. that, that who would take the job, trade me. Absolutely. And that's part of the reason I hired Jeff. It's like I'm not passionate about the day-to-day -day running of a company. That's not, I, I love intellectual problems, I love product problems, go-to-market problems, strategy problems, risk problems, you know, all of those things, board stuff I love. You know, kind of, uh, of saying I'm doing half of my, my week on uh, catch-up meetings with a variety of people, nah, that's not my thing. And so I, you cannot be world-class about something you're not passionate about. So yes. it's like, oh, I'm not the yeah. right person for this job. I was the right person to get it here, but not to get it here, right? And so I need to go find somebody. I think every endeavor onto the room is going, is this me? Is this me? <laughs> you know? You should ask well. that question every yeah. three Abs to six months, right? Six yeah. Months. Wow. Just, it yeah. doesn't mean answer I, I it now. That's right. But just I agree like, with that. Am I the best person? Am I helping the organization? Am I still way? passionate? Yes. And, and am I ready? I'm really right for the next stage. Correct. I, I, I love that. Okay, so now, um, the other thing that, w the way we use sort of the PayPal mafia is, is really in terms of built entrepreneur to entrepreneur led ecosystems. And the idea that um, it's not just about building great companies and hiring great people, it's about investing in and mentoring and inspiring the next generation. Um, and and uh, since you weren't here, we had a very exciting thing happen, Mercado Libre, which is one of those bubbles. Um, it, had two milestones. One is a couple months ago, it became the highest valued company in Argentina, surpassing YPF, the national oil company. And just a few days ago, it became it surpassed 10 billion in, in uh, market cap, yep. becoming awesome. Latin America's first tech decacorn and yes. Endeavor's first decacorn. Yes. I love those guys. Which is awesome. Yes. And all of them, Nico, Sakazi, the yes. CFOs here, they all pay it forward, they all yes. invest in the founder to funder. But one of our, okay. you talk about, I wanted you to do two things. For, before we get to Wences, I want you. I had the, dinner with Wences on Monday. What, well, <laughs> I want you to tell. Talk, I want to talk about his story in a minute. But the reason I want to get to him is when we were talking our conversation in Masters of Scale. Yes. You had this great frame about the entrepreneurial superheroes mm -hmm. that build build ecosystems, and I would love you to share your thoughts. Um. So, part of let's see, there's uh, a couple different angles to this, and I think that. Uh, one of the really key things for the creation of ecosystems is do people look at a certain set of people, you can think of superheroes, and say, do I want to be that person? Does that person, yes. the heroic narrative that is the life that I want to lead, participate in, be part of? And so given that I think that, if anything, over decade by decade, entrepreneurship Every decade is at least doubling in importance to the whole world. If you think about what's going on in globalization, what's going on in, in, in technology and AI and automation, like the only real answer is entrepreneurship, right? I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff, but that's the only real answer. And so then it becomes critical that entrepreneurs are not just the, I build my own company, and I build an amazing company, and I employ a bunch of people, and I pr produce a product and service that people love, all that's awesome, but it's also important that we become leaders of this kind of new class of hero or having kind of superpowers. And ultimately, I think part of the thing that causes cultures to change and evolve is uh, humans are very tribal animals, and humans uh -huh. tend to, to kind of go, who do we look at as uh, role models and canonical types and so forth? And so, and this is obviously one of the things that Endeavor does so awesomely well, but it's to say, here are entrepreneurial role models. Here are things to think about. Here are people and projects and efforts and things to focus on and to celebrate as the things that, uh, that we are trying to create a better uh, society and, and world for us. And so, 
you know, part of well, what I have been putting an increasing amount of time to, part of, part of the reason why, you know, we're uh, uh, allies and colleagues on the Endeavor Project, and I'm delighted to be uh, following your guys' lead and helping out in ways that I can, um, is we need more of, of, of kind of entrepreneurial ecosystems everywhere in the world. And it isn't just globally. Like when I think about Detroit, when I think about yeah. New Orleans, I go, and that's one of the reasons it was awesome that Endeavor said, well, we can do some of this, <laughs> um, is that's what you need in order to fix these areas. Mm -hmm. And so how is it that we as entrepreneurs can act, we as governments act, we as business people can act, we as financiers can act, we as intellectuals can act? What are the kinds of things that enable this? But one very central role is the focus on who are the entrepreneurial superheroes that are not just the builders of great companies, but also the people who go, I know it's not just about me and my company, it's about entrepreneurs, it's about many companies, it's about the ecosystem. And like Wences is, you know, 10 out of 10 on this. Well, and, and one of the things I wanted to ask you about is so Wences, obviously, locally, people heard his story, they say, if Wences can do it, I can do it too, right? We mentioned, I said yesterday, Nevzad Adin, a poll came out in Turkey three years ago asking people's top entrepreneur role models. Three years ago, it was number one, Steve Jobs, number two, Mark Zuckerberg, number three, Bill Gates. After Yem Acceptance is sold, they take the poll again, number one, Steve Jobs, number two, Mark Zuckerberg, number three, Nevzad Adin. Pretty cool. Awesome. Pretty awesome. Yes. Um, but, once, but then he moves, and we have a number of Endeavor entrepreneurs that are moving from the Middle East, from Africa, from Asia, yep. from, the, from Latin America, and suddenly, here he is, he's in the midst of Silicon Valley. He's an Argentine guy. He's not, now he's a serial entrepreneur and successful, but now he's talking about the Bitcoin vault thing. <laughs> yes, and so to Zappo. Walk, <laughs> Zappo, which Endeavor Catalyst is yes. co-invested in, yes, and, and Greylock so, yep. is the lead. So tell, tell us how, you know, how did you parse that? How do people who are, even if they're successful outside of Silicon Valley, when they come in, how are they perceived? Um, well, so... Um, so a typical pattern is to say, no, no, how, try to keep them where they are. And that's not necessarily good advice, even though we want those entrepreneurial ecosystems to foster in that, and we want to celebrate the people who will build those entrepreneurial ecosystems there, and that's a Absolutely. huge, valuable thing. Um, part of, as we get to more and more of the networked age, um, it tends to be that there is a fewer number of companies that succeed at a much higher scale because the whole world is interconnected. It's not just internet stuff but like logistics and energy. It's like, well, you look at what the play between Amazon and e-commerce and retail stores are, and that's just one instance of how interconnectivity, because it used to be you could have a regional retail chain in like three states, and they'd be doing just fine because mm -hmm. that was the kind of competitive ecosystem. But now when you go, okay, we have Walmart, and then we have, which Amazon. is global, so then <laughs> you have Amazon, those battles change. Yes. And so part of what you have to think about as an entrepreneur is if I'm gonna to try to play at the global network scale, what is the central location to do that, right? And so for example, Silicon Valley is really software valley, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you wanna do global software, Silicon Valley is the best place in the world for it. Has all the talent, has all the, like there is, even China, which is amazing, is not as good at the global scale. It's great for China, but it's not as good at the global scale as Silicon Valley. Now. The fortune of that is there's a lot of businesses that are not that are better off being other places. And there's and I hope that the thing I just said, which is Silicon Valley is still the best place for software, I hope we get to five equal places, right? Mm. By all of them improving. It isn't push Silicon Valley down, it's it's how do you how do you because there's a lot of things that could attract it. And I don't think that it's an exponential curve the whole way up. I think it's a vibral, mm. vibrant ecosystem with a bunch of talent and a bunch of capital and a bunch of focus and a bunch of knowledge. So I think it's perfectly possible that one or more other places could be the, well, you could go software here, you could do software here. But right. you need to get to this like supernova, right? Because here, like any single pro software problem you're trying to solve, you're at most two degrees away from a world expert. Right? Yeah, the other interesting thing on the, and watching the multiplier effect over time is the talent issue. Yeah. Because now any company starting in a place like Argentina can poach talent from Mercado Libre or from Globant, yes. and suddenly they have 
high caliber executives. 10 years ago when Mercado Libre, or however long it was when Mercado Libre started in 1999, so mm -hmm. almost 20 years ago, mm -hmm. there was nobody to poach. It was yes. really hard. Yes, exactly. So as you build up and those you have to build up the ecosystems. ecosystems. And so I think it's totally yeah. doable. I want it to happen. But it is still the case, like for example, if you say, well, did I think Wentz has made a mistake by moving here? No. Now, part of the thing that, that makes a difference for him is, is Wences is very well respected here, right, and, and is thought to be a hitter Absolutely. and interesting. Maybe a little, I obviously, Mr. and Zappo and, and everything else, think he's not crazy on the Bitcoin stuff. Most of the Silicon Valley people said, wasn't the Bitcoin thing a big thing a couple years ago? Whatever happened to that? Uh, like, is that still real? Because uh, Silicon Valley is so mad after the future that like literally, like Bitcoin is passed out of discussion. Wow. And it actually, it's like we just don't see it happening. It's not to say we're negative. Uh, yeah. I, well, I think that a lot of people are softly negative on it, but just kind of in there, we're not talking about it. Mm -hmm. But I think he's right in terms of long term. But that being said, um, you know, like I have this kind of funny, like uh, medieval metaphor. Like there's kings and queens and princes and princes and dukes and duchesses. And, you know, like the, 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 the monarchy is like, Larry and Sergey and, and Zuckerberg and, you know, da, da, da. And then, you know, princes are, you know, like Brian Chesky or, you know, like, and it yeah. kind of goes down this kind of, this thing. And, you know, uh, Wences probably when he moved here was probably like an earl, <laughs> right? And, you At know, least maybe he wasn't a pawn, yes, that's good. Yes. <laughs> and maybe as a baron now, I mean, I don't know. But, you know, like, so, you, could you move into this place, which, like, there's good and bad about Silicon Valley being very intensely innerly focused, right? Yeah. The good is, is that it's about as a competitive ecosystem as you'll find, including China, which is massively competitive. And part of the reason global companies move, come out of here as really fierce global companies is because the competition to win here is fierce. And so, like, you merge and you're very strong. But what that all, also means is we pay very little attention to things outside of Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. which creates lots of entrepreneurial opportunity and a bunch of other things. That's a good thing. Um, but it's yes. partially because you just don't have time. You're like you're focused on. Uh, so uh, here, there'll be another Masters of Scale episode that that deals in this. Because when I said this on so an offhand comment to June, she's like, "Oh my God, we got to work that into the system." And I was like, "Oh, okay. I didn't realize that was news." There's a fighter pilot terminology called OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, act. The fighter pilot who has the faster OODA loop uh, wins, and the other fighter pilot dies. Right? It's a critical com, uh, okay. component of training in fighter pilot school. The only business ecosystem that I know that actively describes individuals and organizations OODA loop is Silicon Valley because the speed of competition matters. And when you listen to Zuckerberg's interview on this, like half of his interview was how he tunes up Facebook for speed, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it's, 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 it's. The it, urgency. Yes. Yeah. Right, and that's also one of the reasons why, like when I uh, say, well, if you're not embarrassed by your first product release, you've released too late. For software things, the reason for that is, is the importance of speed. Of course you'd rather not be embarrassed. Of course you'd rather have a really awesome thing. But speed is frequently life or death, and that of course also gets the blitz scaling. It's the speed to scale right. frequently is, it's the, probably most of you have seen this film, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, which is kind of a great David, David Mamet film, and, and now Alec Baldwin's no longer best role. His best role <laughs> is currently playing out on Saturday Night Live. Um, and, um, but amazing role for him. And written by David Mamet for him. Uh, he basically was like, he was talking to a bunch of salespeople. And this is frequently true in the network world. You know, first prize Cadillac, second prize steak knives, steak knives third prize you're fired. Right? And so that's the kind of like right. the battle you're frequently in. So speed really matters. It, that's so interesting, and I would add just one corollary to that for, for the emerging markets, which is ability to handle chaos and instability. And I've always said that I think here we almost prize stability too much, and we get freaked out if things are not stable. Well, the world is no longer stable. The world is turned upside down in so many ways and is so unpredictable. And I actually believe that entrepreneurs coming from outside may not think in terms of that speed and all the time, but think in terms of handling the thing that's right around the corner that's just gonna go throw everything you've been working on completely to crap and you've gotta like restart and there's yes. that element too. Yeah. It's super important to understand that another feature of the network world is do not presume that you know the whole game because the game is always changing. Exactly. It may be that you're lucky and the game has stayed stable for 10 to 20 years, but do not presume it. Okay, so I want to I want to end on some thoughts on Catalyst. Beforehand, you did a wonderful rapid fire round, 
in your Masters of Scale. Oh, okay. So this is a redefined <laughs> Masters of Scale round. There's some things that are specific to you and then some things that are, okay. So first of all, explain <laughs> this. This is called Trumped Up Cards. Um, I, uh, the, the, the entrepreneurial pitch parallel, it's Cards Against Humanity uh, a la Trump, uh, all Trump. And I started it as an entertainment project and then it got very serious. Um, and it's really not as serious as the whole issue about what the administration means to uh, entrepreneurship, means to, to the U.S., means to the world, uh, in terms of you know a, a large uh, set of, of of I think potentially very damaging impacts. But um, uh, it was it was it was trying to use humor as a form of uh, commentary. Okay. Sorry, that made me too long. No, that's good. Oh, first of all, great photo. Okay, and now explain this. Reed's become like Hasbro and Mattel. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, Greylock, a couple years ago, um, celebrated its uh, 50th anniversary, and because it's one of the oldest venture firms. The guy who uh, founded Greylock was um, a George Dorio, who is the French expat oh, yeah. who invented venture capital with yeah. American Research and Development. Bill Alfors was his right-hand guy. He's the guy who founded Greylock oh, in Boston. Yeah. And, and so we were talking about, like, what should we do to celebrate this? And I said, well, look, we should create for our LPs, because part of the thing, and this is true of all the great funds, but all of our LPs are people who've been with us for, like, you know, not all, but, like, a vast mm -hmm. majority have been with us for 40, 50-plus years. And so we should create something that's kind of the history of Greylock and its entrepreneurs and Love its companies. It. And the simplest one, it's, you know, Monopoly is not a really good game, but we should just make a Monopoly, you know, parallel. We're not selling it or anything else. It was just a, it was a gift. And, and Reed also has gifted, um, and, this, and if you come to the Endeavor office, we have a, a copy, a Settlers Catan version for entrepreneurs. Yes, called Startups of Silicon Valley. It's a map of Settlers Catan. Also, because I support entrepreneurs, we don't sell it. Because Settlers right, of Catan should it. be, we just gift it. Yeah. It just is made as a, here's a, and, and I Fabulous. generally give it to people who already have Settlers, because again, those are entrepreneurs. They should sell their product and else. But it was such a clever, good game that the parallels to entrepreneurship were so good. It's the best entrepreneurship board game that I'm aware of. If anyone knows of a better one, I'm always interested. But it involves yeah. trading, and you have to collaborate in order to play to win, and everything else. Like, there's a bunch of things. It's 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 construction. There's a bunch of things. Oh, like you know what we should do there. next? A year from now, we're coming back. Yeah. Let's get version. Let's have game night. Yeah. Let okay, Elena, and let's do let's do a settlers thing. Let's do let's get yeah. copies yes. of this. Yes, we can do that. And do the yes. yeah startups yes. of Silicon Valley. Yes, that awesome. Yes. people who want to still play trumped up cards can do that. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Werewolf. Okay, so you can buy trumped up cards on that one's for sale. Yes, I I bought I gifted that to everybody yeah. I knew. Okay, so apart from anything you've created or settlers favorite board game. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, I, there's a large, I, I like board games because they're ways that you have structured time together. Uh, I'd probably say um, from childhood, it might be Tactics 2 from Avalon Hill because actually, in fact, I think learning the Avalon Hill games is part of what's given me the depth of thinking about strategy and business, wow. uh, roughly. Cool. Yeah. Okay, and your favorite philosopher? Uh, Wittgenstein. Least favorite philosopher? Spinoza. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Well, I, I did spend three years at Oxford studying That's true. philosophy. Okay. Who that is <laughs> it's not... easy to give a quick answer on those questions. <laughs> All right. Who, is the, who that is not a philosopher would you most like to have to dinner? There's a lot. Maybe Marie Curie, um, because you get everything from how she was thinking as a scientific leader. I mean, she's very similar to entrepreneurs, but also doing that as a woman at that time, just amazing. Right, so probably her, but I, I easily be happy with like a thousand people, I'm sure. <laughs> Reed's inviting everybody to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said from history. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite invention? Oh. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, you know, the classic things would be like iPhone or something. Um, I think I'll be a little bit more old school. Penicillin. Good answer. All right, which company do you wish you had built? Oh. Huh. Uh, you know, other than LinkedIn, because, <laughs> you know, I'm happy with that one. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, look, I, uh, I have enormous respect for, look, I guess right now, um, you know, since I'm going down the journey with them, with the Airbnb guys, like, I think this whole notion of, of like, for example, with, with what they're launching in Magical Trips, 
which is turn any location into a potential destination by allowing essentially entrepreneurs to create tourism experiences in each of these cities in the magical trip. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. And like that's part of what I mean by like entrepreneurs to fix the problem. Because you can make Detroit into a tourist destination. You're like, what the hell? How, how would that work? Well, they have a whole art scene. Create the art scene as a tourism destination using like magical trips and Airbnb. And so mm. what they're doing is like just awesome. And like that would be the kind of thing I would like I to do. I love that. Look at the passion. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're running out of time, so I'm going to ask one more, and then I want to ask my last question, which mm. is you had everyone um, who you interviewed uh, have share a piece of a poem or a song or something they'd memorized. So. Oh. Um, well, you know, roughly speaking, I think the Hillel quote, um, um, if I am only for myself, what am I? If I am not for myself, who will be for me? If not now, then when? I think I it's a, that. it's like something like 17 words. And each that. word matters, and it's really central to being a good person. And, and that, by the way, when, Reed, when we first met in 2007, 2008, in, in Reed's book, he, he came to me and said, look, I know all about Endeavor. If you're asking me to be on your board, the answer is it's not, not, not if but when. Yes. Right? And then he'd say, a year later. It's, if you want, you know, if you want me to get involved, it's not, uh, if, it's not uh, if but when. So then, after you came to an ISP in Turkey, I said, "When is now?" <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, yes. And it was amazing. Yes. And Reed got down on his knee and proposed. Yes. It was yes. very cute. <laughs> with me, with his wife Michelle yeah. there, yes. standing by. Bo bo yes, both of us <laughs> happily married. Okay, my last question, because I know we're over, <laughs> but this is just so important. So. You, well, I won't play the clip, but you have this other thing. I, I actually never heard, which is you talk about the hero's journey mm -hmm. on every board. And so I'd like you can t uh, give a little bit about your framework, but I w would love to hear your vision, uh, since we're all here for Endeavor Catalyst, mm -hmm. which is part of the broader Endeavor mission. If you were to describe going forward, like in terms of how big this can be and how we should be thinking about it, what, what is the hero's journey for, for Endeavor and Catalyst? So, um, look, I'm, uh, as you know, uh, more or less every hour is 10x booked for me, right? So it's a competition between a number of things. And Endeavor is the leading organization in the entire world for saying, look, we're having this networked age coming. Uh, entrepreneurship is the pattern by which we solve this and the pattern by which we integrate many areas of the world, which include now places in the U.S., Right, not just other things, to become a vibrant part of the future because entrepreneurship is centered to that. And that's part of the reason why you know, I'm here on this journey with you. And, uh, and part of the discussion we had was with Catalyst was to say, well, the right thing to do is to uh, structure a way. It's absolutely right that, that, that Endeavor should always be entrepreneur first, <laughs> right? There's the members first, et cetera. And we should structure a way that we're staying there, but we also invest a little bit so we get we create our own sustainability in this future that we're creating. And I think that uh, Endeavor Catalyst has that uh, potential to do that, both for Endeavor and for enabling this future, because I do think that there will be, like, you know, 10, 20 years from now, the, the entrepreneurial hero story will be growing much broader than the West Coast of the U.S., Right, uh, and that's a great thing for all of us. Well, I want to thank you not only for being here today, Reed, but for all that you've done. Endeavor Catalyst wouldn't exist without you, and so please join me in thanking Reed. Yeah.